assessment altered mental status station. In addition to your normal assessment equipment like blood pressure cuff and stethoscope, you'll also look for oxygen and oral glucose. In this skill, you will have 15 minutes to perform your assessment, patient interview, and voice treat all conditions discovered. You should conduct your assessment as you would in the field, including communicating with your simulated patient. You may remove your simulated patient's clothing down to his or her shorts or swimsuit if you feel it is necessary. As you progress through this skill, you should state everything you are assessing. Specific clinical information not obtainable by visual or physical inspection, for example blood pressure, should be obtained from the simulated patient just as you would in the out-of-hospital setting. You may assume you have two partners working with you who are trained to your level of care. They can only provide the interventions you indicate necessary, and I will acknowledge all interventions you order. I may also supply additional information and ask questions for clarification purposes. You arrive at the scene of a 50-year-old male who is an insulin-dependent diabetic and is mildly confused, as well as hypoglycemic. BSI, is the scene safe? The scene is safe. Okay, the mechanism of injury is that my uh, patient is a medical patient who has uh, is an insulin-dependent diabetic with some altered mental status, and he is the only patient, but because of the chief complaint, from what you tell me, I'm going to think about having an ALS intercept, and also whatever uh, assistance I have, I'm gonna ask them to help me out as, as well. So, sir, hi, my name's Gary, I'm from the ambulance. What's your name? My name is Bill. Okay, how can I help you today, Bill? Uh, I called because I just I feel a little bit, I just feel strange, a little bit confused. I'm not sure, completely sure what's going on. Okay. Uh, did you fall, Bill, or is there any way you could have fallen? No, I don't think I fell no. at all. Okay. All right, so I'm considering stabilization of the spine, and that's not indicated in this case. My general impression of my patient is that he's conscious, he's speaking to me. I'm not sure what his level of orientation is, and I'll get to that. Uh, he doesn't appear to have any life threats, and there doesn't appear to be any major bleeding at this point. So, Bill, can you talk to me a little bit about what happened today? I don't, like I said, I just, I'm not completely sure what's going on. I just, I think I'm confused on a couple of things. I'm not positive. Sure, okay. Do you know where you are right now? Yeah, I know where I am. I'm at home. Okay. And how old are you? 50. All right. And what year is it? Mm, 2010. Okay. He appears to be breathing appropriately. He's answering questions. Um, and with, with normal sentencing. And uh, do you have any shortness of breath, Bill? No. no. Okay, I'd assess his breath sound to see if it's equal um, bilaterally. And uh, Bill, I'm gonna uh, put you on a little bit of oxygen, okay? I think that's gonna help you. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna give him 15 liters uh, of oxygen not via non rebreather mask at this point. And Bill, I'm gonna just go ahead and assess your pulse here, okay? Mm -hmm. Just straighten this arm off for me. I've also assessed major bleeding before and there's nothing that I can see that's obviously um, apparent. And I'm going to check his pulse, respirations at the same time, and also his skin color, temperature, and condition. Bill's pulse is 76, his respiratory rate is 18, his skin is pink, warm, and dry. Um, my patient priority at this point is of a high priority. He seems to be a little confused, the person, place, and time. And uh, my transport decision is we're gonna treat him as a high priority patient, and we're gonna intercept with an ALS service. Um, Bill, I'm just gonna ask you some questions around what happened today, okay? Okay. All right, so how long do you think this has been going on? Uh, I started maybe like 45 minutes ago or so that I first started noticing. Okay. Has this ever happened to you before? May have. It may have. All right. But you don't really recall that? No. Okay. So you wouldn't be able to tell me if this is worse than what has happened to you like this in the past? No. no. Okay. All right. Did you do anything to try to make yourself feel better? No. No? Okay. And this has been going on for 45 minutes, mm -hmm. you said? All right. Good. And did you take any medications today? 
Not uh, not no. No. You, did you say that you take insulin or no? Yes, I did take insulin. I took that last night. You took it last night. Okay. Did you eat anything today? Like, so I had a little bit. Had a piece, a couple pieces of toast at like six o'clock this morning. Okay. Um, other than insulin, do you take any other medications? No. Do you have any allergies to medications? No. Okay. As I go through this too, if there's a bystander that knows a little bit more about what the patient's talking about because he's altered mental, I would inquire to that bystander to see if she he or he can clarify anything that I'm asking this patient because of their their mental status. Um, and do, do you know what you were doing before last night before you started not feeling too well? I mean, last night or today? Or today. today. I was I was just doing a couple of little chores around the house. I was going to get ready to have lunch in a little while. Okay. All right. But did you eat or did not eat? Did not eat, yes. Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to assess the patient a little bit further and ask him specific questions about um, how his presentation. Do you have any chest pain at all? No. And you said you didn't have any shortness of breath, right? No, no trouble okay. breathing. Do me a favor, just stretch out your arm for me. And I'm just going to flip it over. And I want you to squeeze my fingers. Do you feel me touching you? Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're wiggling your fingers okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to just check your capillary refill, which is brisk, not delayed. I'm going to do the same thing over here, Phil, okay? Okay. All right, squeeze my fingers. Good, you feel me touching you? Yep. And you can wiggle your fingers okay? And your capillary refill is brisk, not delayed. Put your, your feet together, there you go, just like that. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to push against your foot. Can you feel me pushing against mm -hmm. you? All right, can you step down against my hand? Awesome, good. Same thing here, can you feel me push? Yep. All right, push down against me. Nice job, good, okay. Um, is there anything else that you, you're feeling? Are you nauseous at all? Feel sick to your stomach? Not really. No, do you have a headache? Are you no. dizzy? No. No? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and take your blood pressure now, okay? okay. You've had this done before, correct? Yep. All right, so it's going to come right up here. It's going to squeeze a little bit, but it's not going to hurt. Okay. patient's blood pressure is 130 over 70, his respiratory rate is 18, and his heart rate is 76. My field impression of the patient is that he is a high priority patient um, due to his altered mental status. We already have an ALS intercept in route. And uh, the interventions that I would do is one potential intervention is the administration of oral glucose. Uh, he has an appropriate level of consciousness, although he is a little bit confused. The person, place, and time, I would contact the emergency department and ask for permission per protocol for the administration of oral glucose. And en route, I would actually reassess his vital signs, maintain oxygen therapy, and continue to talk to my patient, uh, making sure there's no significant change in his mental status. And when I intercept with the R5 or the paramedic EMS unit, I'll tell them that I have a 50-year-old male patient, past medical history of insulin-dependent diabetes. Um, patient hasn't really taken his medication appropriately over the last several, uh, 24 hours or so and uh, has not eaten appropriately either. So he called me about 20 minutes ago because he was a little bit unclear as to his surroundings. And my findings are that he's relatively stable as far as his vital signs are concerned. He does have an altered mental status. Um, I did call the emergency department and I'll tell them whatever order that the emergency department gave me to administer. And I'm transferring care over to them. And now I'm done with my station. Okay, so now you've had the opportunity to see the station and how it's supposed to go in your testing scenario. But remember, there's a whole bunch of critical criteria attached to this that can fail you basically right away. So I'm just going to review these and kind of talk to you a little bit more about what to expect. So your failure to initiate or call for transport of the patient within a 15 minute time limit is very, very important. Obviously, you want to prioritize these patients in a high manner for most of them. But 15 minutes is an excessive amount of time on scene. Um, so you want to take that into consideration. Failure to take or verbalize appropriate body substance isolation precautions. Always have your BSI. And failure to determine scene safety before approaching the patient. Of course, 
the number one person on the scene is you and you have to make sure that you're safe. Failure to voice and ultimately provide appropriate oxygen therapy, the old adage, never deprive your patient of oxygen. And also failure to assess and provide adequate ventilation, very, very important for these scenarios. Failure to find or appropriately manage problems associated with airway, breathing, hemorrhage, or shock. Remember the ABCs are the top things that you need to address. Failure to differentiate the patient's need for immediate transportation versus continued assessment or treatment on scene. So when you prioritize these patients, you need to address and you need to say it out loud. I'm going to transport these patients immediately based on their clinical findings, their signs and symptoms, and their complaints. Perform secondary examination before assessing and treating threats to airway, breathing, and circulation. Always, again, start with your ABCs. If you order a dangerous or inappropriate intervention, that's an immediate failure at the station. Failure to provide accurate reporting to arriving EMS unit, extremely important that you know what you're talking about, that you do an appropriate history, and that you, you translate that information over to the next provider. That's really important because you're starting to build the story for the patient. So when the patient gets to the emergency department, the clinical staff there can understand really what went on with your patient in the pre-hospital environment. Failure to manage the patient as a competent EMT. It's all about the fact that you know what you're doing. When you get into a, sit a situation where you're actually with the patient, obviously competence is something that you're gonna have to show, but you're also gonna have to convey the fact that you're confident in the, your abilities and in yourself. Exhibit unacceptable affect with patient or other personnel. Affect is the value stream, so it's how you present yourself. And in situations like these, testing scenarios or real life, you have to be professional and that affect is really important for you um, to maintain a good role as an EMS provider. Uses or orders a dangerous or inappropriate intervention, that really speaks for itself. So if you ask for the wrong thing, for the wrong presentation, you're gonna immediately fail your station. So just be cognizant of all these critical criteria. They're as important as the objectives that you're studying to pass the practical scenario. And just remember to review this before you go in and also review it after to make sure that you didn't hit any of these criteria. Good luck.